Hello, Darren. Hi, Darren. You're all blurred. There we go. Slowly, Darren comes into focus. Once I start painting, does it always stay in focus then? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever done that thing when you've, uh, you try and pinch something to make it go bigger, which is actually a printed page? I just did yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> that's the book in front of me to try and make a picture. Yeah. Bigger. It's uh, slightly oh. worrying, isn't it? Isn't it amazing to think that children grow up with that stuff, not being amazed? Yeah. Like the fact that a glass surface, um, the fact that a glass surface can uh, be, have buttons on it, it's still kind of mind blowing to me. I still don't really understand how that is the case. It is. It's um, extremely clever. Straight out of science fiction, straight out of Star Trek, isn't it? Yeah. But really, it's um, really cool. Um, so today I want to talk about something that's been um, on my mind a bit recently. So nothing good. Always That always sounds like it's a, a prelude to some bad news, doesn't it? I want to talk about something that's been on my mind. Yeah. Um, um, no um, um Something I've been thinking about and it's been fascinating me. I watched a film um, a few weeks ago called The Jazz Loft. The uh-huh. Jazz Loft, according to Eugene Smith, it's called. Eugene Smith was a photographer in New York. Right. And he was a, a reportage photographer at the time when reportage photography was in a real golden period. He had... Yeah. Um, Life magazine, which was one of these, um, the big sellers in uh, reportage photography. Uh, and these photographers would go all over the world, uh, depicting uh, stories, uh, news stories, um, bits of um, kind of natural history, all, you know, a very fascinating, interesting mixed bag of things. And he yeah. lived in his loft in, uh, downtown New York in the flower district. And um, this loft was, um, it was kind of a a strange, unregulated space. Uh, Because the flower district was business district, there weren't many people lived down there. Everyone, all the businesses closed at night and went home. Um, And he kind of, he did rent this loft space, but it was almost like the, the, there were squatters there. They, you'd you'd get you'd have him, him in his space doing his photography, developing photographs of which he had thousands of prints all over the walls. He was kind of a um, complex personality, um, quite obsessive with his photography. Probably why he was so good. Um, Being a, a in neighbouring rooms of the loft and upstairs and downstairs, uh, jazz bands would come and play and jazz musicians would just hang out and jam and rehearse. And they it, sort often... of, it sort of reminds me of um, Tony Hancock and the Rebel, that kind of scene, that kind yeah. of life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this, the, these jams would go on for hours. You know, the musicians would probably turn up after a gig in New York. So they'd roll in about midnight, start jamming, and then uh, it was basically that the, the, the uh, one of the phrases in the film was when the sun came up, it was time for us to go to bed. So they'd be jamming all night long. And um, one of the musicians that would go there was a composer called Hall Overton. And he was a, a traditional composer and arranger, but he... he worked in the realms of jazz as well. And he used to teach there too. People, some of his like private students would go to this loft and he'd give them lessons there. And one of these students, I'm getting to my point, one of these students was Steve Reich, a oh. well-known 20th century composer. And so when is and this happening again? This is in uh, 
kind of from around like the 50s and 60s in New York, right. early 60s. And um, Steve Reich said one of Hall Overton's best pieces of advice that he gave him was about developing a theme. And uh, he, 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 it seemed that Steve Reich had his mind blown by, by what he taught him. And he said, you could, you could start off with, um, we'll do it on this paper. You can start off with a line, a melodic line there, and then maybe take that line, make it go up that direction. Maybe make it go down. Maybe stack the line up. So you've got two lines now doing the same thing. Yeah, and, and he, he, he was always elaborating on this thing and developing this idea. And, yes. um, and I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating partly because I knew this already, because I'd done music theory at college. But it's one of those things that I'd kind of either forgotten about or just start, I, I do it naturally in my music now. I think a lot of musicians do without even realising that's what they're doing. Um, a good example, I heard it on the radio today, was uh, that I'm sure the writers of the song, I think it's Kevin Rowland, never sat down and thought about this. But come on, Eileen, you've got a little bit of development there because you've got the same phrase in, I think it's three different... Um, Starting notes on the in the in the stave. So you got ba da da da. And then the next line is ba da da da. Ba da da da. You see, it's the same phrase uh, three okay. different times. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's that it's what musicians do all the time without thinking about it. But I think when you're writing a more um, um, thoughtful piece of music in in terms of say it's a classical piece or it's a piece for several instruments and it's been written. In, on paper and that um, these are things that you think about uh, because it's, they don't always have the same structure that a simple pop song does and this theme of developing something is really helpful to, for you to get to the end of the piece and finally come up with something uh, and it's amazing it's such a simple idea but you get whole symphonies from it from that that one idea of just develop a theme and um <laughs> I'm kind of yeah. fascinated about it. And if, if it's um, in music, we do it all the time. And we do either develop a musical theme or we develop a lyrical theme. You, you do a lot, don't you? You're, certainly your lyrical work, I think. Is, well, um, it's, it's, it's funny because um, you, last night we uh, did the last 12, toys of christmas and you wanted to sort of uh you had this idea for doing this today so you just clued me up slightly yeah we were going to do it and i sort of i sort of came away like giving it a little bit of thought in regards to today and i sort yeah. of started to think i started to be a bit hard on myself and started to think actually I don't know if I do do this that much. Right. Okay. Um, but, but actually maybe in that kind of longer explana explanation just then, maybe yeah. I was inclined to think, um, maybe I was inclined to be a bit softer on me and maybe, oh no, maybe I do. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the idea of, um, Never considering the first way to be the way. Oh, yeah. sorry, my tell is suddenly pitching. <laughs> Turned itself on. Um, um, I think to, to never think that the first way you think an idea should be should be that way is something I try and say to myself all the time. Yeah, and I think that's that's happening uh, lately with me and my band, right? That I go in and say, "Here's a song. I think it goes like this," and then at the end of an hour, when you've got uh, 
uh, three other people in there to, to sort of be able to say quite easily, oh, I guess it doesn't go like that. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a healthiness in that which comes out of doing it for a long time. I think that's harder to do that when you uh, you're first got your first band. Because in your first band, especially if you're a songwriter and a slightly bossy person, or not bossy, um, slightly self-assured. Yeah. I don't know. I've never really been in a band which creates things out of jamming. And I've not, no, I've not. really s- sort of... S- I've never really seen that much use in jamming not to say there isn't at all and not to say i've never written a song that's come out of some people mucking about i have done that but i think i don't think i could stand being in a band that did, did that all the time and yet i think a band that was like that might be a band that might be um doing what you're talking about yeah in, that, in fact that's the only way they can do it isn't it the only way they can do it is like, we've got this thing here now. How do we turn it into another thing? Or, or how, how do we develop from this part to this part? That's the only way it yeah. can happen. It can only happen yeah. through playing and calling it. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And I think, I think a lot of my creativity in songwriting, an awful lot of it, in actual fact, um, happens away from the instruments. Right. I yeah. sort of find instruments themselves to be quite a distraction. And uh, my hand tends to, my hands tend to move in the same way um, out of habit. And I'm yes. trying to find them to not do that. Yeah. Consequently as well, what I tend to find is, is that by, um, writing away from the instrument you tend to refine the chords that you previously had uh dismissed as obvious yeah so when you spend a few years playing guitar you tend to find yeah okay i know that chord sequence i've used that before i know why that works i know why i return to it and then you come away from it and then you sing something and then you go back to the guitar and go oh it is still those chords it's yeah. just that now yeah. i'm not trying to think of something to fit the guitar the guitar is 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 coming to what the voice is doing i'm, I'm yeah, starting to yeah, think a yeah. bit too off the subject for you now though well one i mean i think um one thing i, I was thinking about about this musical development um is how that does that correspond to to visual arts um uh, because we tend to in in pretty much all of these videos that we've we've done from I think August 2022 onwards until now, we've sat down and we've drawn something, and we draw it and it's finished, and that is the thing. Yeah, and and it's interesting. Even me, who, who does a lot of sketching in a sketchbook, which are Theoretically, sketchbooks are meant to be for putting ideas down. The things in my sketchbook become the thing. Yeah, I will. I will scan the sketchbook and say, "This is this is my drawing." I did, and um, I'm, I think I'm interested in maybe this year. And I don't. I don't want to. I'm not really one for resolutions as such, but maybe attempt to use a sketchbook a bit more as an ideas thing and then let that sketchbook feed um, other pieces. Uh, and I'm wondering how, how, you know, development in, in visual arts will, will work really. Well, I mean, I think one thing about Steve Reich and jazz is they are immediately in a uh, genre which suits this way of thinking more straight away. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Because Steve Wright is dealing in the abstract. Yeah. And and as soon as you've um, 
you've got a sort of, uh, you know, half hour, three quarter of an hour piece, you, um, you have the ability to, to, to find minor variations on it. Yeah. I like Steve Reich and I like jazz. Yeah. And I'm always interested in what it may or may not be doing to, right. uh, to, to me and, uh, and my creativity. I'm not sure what it's doing. I can't, I, it can't be, it, it, it seems impossible that it's done nothing. But at the same time, yeah. I largely don't improvise. I largely don't do long pieces. In fact, kind of one of the central things about, one of the, the central things of what I do, both in uh, art and, and in music, and I think one of the things that's quite me, is decisiveness. Yeah. Um, was I talking to you about this the other day? There's a there's there's the the, the Bob Ross thing when he's talking, and he's yes. talking through his paint instructions, and sometimes he says this thing. I've heard him say it a few times. He goes, "I'll paint paint the shape here. Make some decisions." Yeah. And so I think, in a way, that kind of runs ever so slightly counter to what you're talking about because yeah i think my inclination is to, to 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 have a sort of intellectual plan about what i'm going to do make some decisions about how i'm going to approach it achieve it and then do it and either fail or don't the, the, yeah. During the making of 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 the piece of music or the painting, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't really leave much room for chance and accident, and yeah. and 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 also or de- or or development during it, which I think is what you're talking about, isn't it? How do yeah. you yeah. develop during the process? Yeah, or do you develop? Um... Do you treat your your first drawing as uh, one of many that lead up to a finished thing? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can see how I'm talking at odds with myself, though, because I think you are right in another <laughs> thing. I do do that. I do definitely do. You know, I like, I like, I like people's career uh, who it seems like they're doing um, – you know, they're spending their lifetime trying to perfect one song. Yeah. And we could definitely say that of Steve Reich, couldn't we? Steve Reich, yep. Yeah. And at the opposite end of that, uh, Billy Childish. Billy Childish, Mark. Although Smith. he's not really trying to perfect that one song, is it? He's decided that that one song is, is his song that he's going to do again and again and again. Uh, see, I, see I, think, I, think, I think Billy Childish, in his way, is very much a perfectionist and is very much trying to perfect it. That right, perfection yeah. might not be a sort of perfection we think of in terms of studio perfection or, no, or, no, or anything no. like that. It's not not what many people would regard. It, it, it is he is doing what many people would regard to be a, a, an imperfect sound. But I think, um, despite all his punk rockness, in terms of all those kind of <laughs> ADHD. The auti- autistic tendencies musicians have to constantly perfect and get right. Yeah. I think uh, Billy Childish is is still that that person. Right. I think yeah. what he's doing though is is I think the thing Billy Childish does is he is constantly developing, but he's always showing his workings out, isn't he? Yes, yes. So whatever exactly. he does exactly. is really whatever it ever it does is good enough to show us. Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of more what I do with my with my sketching is that it I kind of like the idea of of showing the the, the rawness that I that think is, that's uh, what I do as well in yeah in yeah. in, in, in uh, my songwriting too. I mean, I can sort of remember when you know even quite early on when. 
to Pure, my record company would say, well, do you think this can be better, Darren? Do you want to go back and do it again? And I remember at yeah. one point them offering, you know, we're going to put some more money into you. We want you to go and record some of these songs a bit better. And of course, even, even at that stage, you know, from, from being a, you know, an art college sued, you know, I was able to go, well, <laughs> what do you mean by better? <laughs> and they said I don't know oh, it will sell 20,000 more. more copies <laughs> well I mean I mean um, have I talked to you about the uh, tambourine theory um, I I think I, I've heard it said I think you've put it on Twitter before Go basically on. when you record your song for a record company don't put a tambourine on it when they say, oh, it needs something more, it just needs a bit more, mm, then go and put a tambourine right. on it. And then they right. go, oh, that's better, it's nicer. Uh, tambourines <laughs> make things sound sparkly, people like shiny yeah. things, stupid people yeah. like shiny things, put a tambourine on it. <laughs> well, I'm laughing now when you just said <laughs> stupid things, people like sparkly things, because I always put a tambourine on my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Me like I'm not, saying, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying there's not anything. My, uh, uh, John, John in my band had a story about a band. I think I do know who the band was. And um, they got, they did, they went through this, this situation. They, they'd done the record and, and, and the record company said, mm, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's not quite there. Can you go back and, and here's some more money. Go back into the studio and uh, just see if you can make it, pep it up a bit. Yeah. And apparently they literally did nothing. They, yeah. they went back to the studio and played Paul for about three or four days. And then, <laughs> I don't know, maybe they turned it up or something and took yeah. it back. And the record company is like, there you go. See, I'm glad you listened to us. Much better. <laughs> do you do you know the story about Steely Dan's first album? Uh, I don't think so. Tell me. <laughs> Before it was released, but when it was finished, and yeah. it had been it was ready for release. It was approved. It was all ready to to go. Um, Donald Fagan sent a copy to the uh, his labels A and R department. Uh, and they replied to him, said, well, thanks for sending us this, but it's not what we're looking for at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I've no idea how true that is. But uh, it wouldn't be surprising if it is true. Um, I don't mind naming this person because I think it reflects well on him. Um, I, I only for a very small uh, period had Russell Warby as my booking agent. He was a famous booking agent at the time. I think he might have been. Right. Like Nirvana's booking agent or someone, he had big okay. names. And uh, he was, I was doing one album, finish one album, and he said, Right, uh, get send us a tape over there and I'll send it out and get gigs. This is one of those tapes. And I said, uh, Yeah, all right, okay, Russell. The, the problem is, is it, it, it's not really mastered yet. We might do a couple more mixes, so maybe you should wait. <laughs> and he just went, Darren, when they master it, is that when they put the tunes in? I went, no. He went, right, fuck off. Give us, send us a tape. <laughs> <laughs> there is a man with experience of dealing with new acts. <laughs> <laughs> I've used that. I've used that before. I've used that. I, I've nicked that when someone's saying, um, oh, do you think the mastering's on this right, Darren? Or do you think it should be a bit more this? I said, I don't know. Uh, have they put a tune in? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> but yeah, so this I'm going to endeavour to um maybe do oh. some more sketching oh. in prep work and stuff. Exploration. Yeah. I'm not sure if I can actually really think of a, a definite applicable thing of, of that example you used of the line interceding here. Can it be that or can it be that? 
I can't quite think of 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 an immediate application to the way of pain. I mean, except that after you said that, and I thought about what I want to do, I kind of thought that one thing that has been happening accidentally yeah. in my painting this year is um, I've been painting more and more without line. You have, yeah. And, and this thing, you know, and so I did think, okay, well, maybe that is an example of a sort of, development the first time it happened it happened by accident because i was drawing and i drew one part i think i remember the painting actually where I'd, i had the foreground with lines and i painted a bit of the background and so what i'm trying to do here in front of you maybe you can even see yeah. it's a train with a signal box yes yeah. yeah but i think this is an example of a um scene a picture which I would previously look at and consider to be impossible actually without line. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so I thought for today, maybe this today was the day to do, I mean, it's, it's, it's so silly to call it a risk, isn't it? I mean, it's just paper, <laughs> isn't it? It's just paper and paint. Why is it? Yeah. A risk? It is, but we feel like we take risks where every time we put, put the pen or the, I see. I think I think you do more than I do, and I right. still maintain that that you are more the proper artist out of the two of us. I think you are more on a quest than me. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I won't think, argue with you. Though, and I, I think, think that you're really more right. like, how shall I do today? I think. I think. Also in my music, I do sort of stick to some sort of formulas. I think subject-wise, I think in my songs, I've kind of got this, this reputation for, well, he can do a song about anything, because I did albums about the Essex Witch Trials and things. And I think I, I like that yeah. reputation. I, mean, yeah. I don't think I'm necessarily safe, but I still think you're more inclined to pick up a paper and pen and think, well, this could be anything, really. I have no idea. You you have a sense of wonder about what right. you're doing. You you sort of think, well, this could this could be anything at all. I have no idea how this is going to turn out. I think I I am sort of a little bit more sure. Oh, I'm going to do this. I've done this before. I think I know this is going to work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't like it either. It's worth adding. I kind of um, I would prefer to be. Uh, more like yourself and so in terms well, of as you say I mean, not, being one for, <laughs> not being one for new year's resolutions that much either um i also kind of would like a sort of to to, de to develop more i'd like to learn yeah. more things yeah i mean it's funny it probably won't surprise you art artists being being artists that i don't necessarily like um the fact that I have that in me that I can sit down and, you know, this could be anything, uh, because very often I, it kind of turns out to be either nothing or there's a, sometimes feels there's, there's, although there's, there are certain themes that run through my art. So I sometimes, because I'm often grabbing at stuff and like, uh, searching, it sometimes feels like I've, I've never really settled on, on what I do as an artist. And I can find that quite frustrating. Hmm. So, um, we should meet somewhere in the middle, shouldn't we? I, I think the thing that I want, the thing that I, I had a, I, I've sort of let it slide by. I had a, a, a sort of offer of an exhibition in the summer. Yes. Yeah. I never got back and I've sort of through my own fear, I've sort of, I don't know that the, the, the doors closed on it, but I sort of didn't push it yeah. in a way that I perhaps should have done. And I was thinking that if I got that, I felt like the prices in this ex in this, uh, I felt like the prices in this exhibition and the, the, the lady that owned it was also an art dealer. 
I saw it maybe as a chance to uh, be better or charge more, but mm. I also saw it as like I'm not yet good enough. Like, like if I did okay. that exhibition, my intention was right. I'm going to have to do some really good stuff. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Because, um, and I would be the same. Yet you were you were originally asked on the strength of what you'd already done. That's true. Yeah. Mm. Um, but I also sort of it also caused me to think, what is the best thing you do, Darren? You know, what is the best right. thing to build upon? And I don't know whether you agree, but what I kind of thought as my most God, it's awful, isn't it? Um, it's, it's interesting forcing us to say these words. But what <laughs> I thought of as my most proper art or the most the stuff that makes people most stroke their chins, let's say, right. is, <laughs> is, the, is, is the nighttime, the, um, yeah. the nocturne paintings. Yeah. And so I sort of, my idea was to do that. And I also have since then, as I think I told you, being offered a an exhibition in uh, a small exhibition in Barcelona. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and so my thoughts again go to that there. The the, the most kind of oh lovely Darren. I don't know what I mean by this. I don't know what I mean by this because in some ways I'm saying the most likable paintings, but I'm also saying. I don't know. It's fucking madness, isn't it? What am I saying? Well, your night, your night paintings have got two strong things going for them. They've got, uh, uh, they're well painted, and they've also got a a very interesting theme. There is an intellectual theme there as well. I can intellectualize yeah. about what I'm doing. I can say, right, these are about home. Um, when I first started doing them, I thought that they were actually in a way very much about uh, lockdown. Um, yeah. I thought there was more people inside and we were all thinking about our, our we were all thinking about our interiors. Um, um, these were, before I forget, there was another thing I was thinking about development wise and ideas. Um, it's all connected. Um, I have this, feeling or this theory that if you a couple of theories about ideas actually one is that if an idea is good it's good enough to be done multiple times um and i'll say that with a song if you've got a good mel mel a good idea in a song write three songs with it um and also i think that one good idea should lead on to two or three more good ideas and I'm those good thinking, ideas yeah i'm actually thinking more and more that i was doing what you're talking about with the night paint yeah. so i started doing them as watercolors then i changed the paint and then i started yeah. experimenting and the ones i started to like more were the ones that had less and less windows in the more yeah you, and you moved on to like drawing a Buses and cars on the road. Yeah, and the more, sort of, but the more isolated the action was. So if it was like, like an incredibly sort of black landscape with just two chinks of light, they tended to work more and more. It tended to be about the 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 loneliness or the isolation of the window that was lit. Yeah, yeah. So, so visually and intellectually, the the idea was 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 changing. Yeah. When I say intellectually, I don't mean that I'm like, you know, Sigmund Freud with a book. I just mean that I just mean that I'm sort of, you know, thinking without the paintbrush in my hand, I suppose. I mean yeah. I conceptualize yeah. outside of the action. Right. So I hear what I'm doing then. I've been working on drawings inspired by one object which is, I'm going to bring it into the shot, it's this little fellow. Okay. Who's he? A little bit dark. He's called um, Gentle Jeff. Oh, hold on. And he's got fuzzy hair. 
So he looks a bit like Jeff Lynn. He's uh, right. he's got a t-shirt on that says "In Sequins Casual," and he's a character of my friend John Reynard, um, who our mutual friend Robert Alcro does music for. He's got okay. his own YouTube channel with lots of strange sketches and characters. Um, but it's just and he's not really re- maybe he's relevant actually because I think Sean's probably someone who takes an idea and runs with it and lets gets other ideas from it and he's constantly developing his uh, YouTube channel. Um, but I'm trying to just draw, use the objects as inspiration, draw things from it, do like an original, try and draw it properly and then skip that and draw just the shapes that it inspires and then look at a detail, try and draw it really loosely, draw a massive close-up of an eye or just draw his nose. And I am getting doing something like this. I am seeing more than one piece that I can get from it. It's funny. I think I'm starting to, I'm starting to, I'm starting to now go from initially thinking I don't do this very often to now thinking (laughs) I do do it quite often actually. See? Yeah. Yeah. I'm starting to think how how I was constantly sort of doing the same composition over and over again when I was in Spain. And I kept going for cathedrals and, and I had that theme of those narrow streets. And once I'd seen it, I kept redoing it. You did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it. I think we do it all the time. Um, and I know as musicians, we definitely do. Um, but... um. Doing doing this is quite valuable for me because I am I can see three three things that I'm gonna redo in a more complete version already. Yeah, this is fun as well over here. I mean I don't know how clear it is, but it's just sort of It's very clear. I'm having to sort of think about I like having to think about planes and then so I'm trying to well not aeroplanes I'm trying <laughs> planes, of, planes of light and I'm trying yeah. to I'm trying to think of everything here from the photo I'm working from as as groups of colour yeah so that when you're painting with line there's something cartoony about what you're doing there is yeah you're saying right here is the outline of the stairs and there's something essentially, we talked about this before, there's a something essentially diagrammatic about what I do. And there is in what you do sometimes, but sometimes there isn't. I think you find that leap to uh, paint, you know, a little easier. Like, you know, when you're painting Dennis Wartman's head, you go, well, Dennis Wartman's head, kind of this shape we'll worry about the bits in between afterwards yes whereas i think about whereas i think there's something about me that's still a little bit more hold on it has to look like a head doesn't it right yeah and so there's something about the order which i would approach a painting like this in that right let's draw the front of the train the front of the train has two lights and it has three windows yeah So what I did is I've chosen a picture here, which has quite a lot of contrast in the shadows. And I'm trying to just paint the lightest bits and with layers kind of gradually go back until I have the train. Yeah. For instance, one thing about painting trains I've often noticed is you often can't really see the wheels at all. The wheels on train are a whole mess of yeah. you know, wires and springs and general yeah, stuff. Yeah. And 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 you feel like you need to articulate to the viewer there are wheels on a track here. But actually yeah. the wheels on the track are very rarely something you can see. That's right. Be interested to talk to our friend Sarah, Sarah Lippitt, about, about this. She um, draws things repeatedly, doesn't she? And she um, does, yeah. And she she teaches, and she's tell always telling her students about iterations. 
I mean, she nearly told us off in a drawing club. But oh, uh, what was that? We don't. We, I think um, it was either me or you who said, we draw it once and we sell it, <laughs> something like that. And she said, she said, yeah, you wouldn't last five minutes in my class. <laughs> oh, I want to go. I want to, um, I want to go back into that then. I, I sort of <laughs> vaguely remember it, but I, I think. Uh... I think the point being that we, we're not often, I mean, you do sometimes do more than one iteration of something if it's for a commission and the client's not totally keen on it. Um, but obviously when Sarah is teaching people who are going to go on and work for clients all the time and they have to get used to drawing many versions of, of ideas yeah. Yeah, and of maybe they, giving two or three ideas to the clients for yeah. illustration work and that. Yeah. That's kind yeah. of an iteration for for business purposes, isn't it? And it's yeah. kind of common sense for for someone like that to be able to do it because then they don't get too attached to one idea, uh, only to be really disappointed when it gets thrown back in the face as not not what they're looking for. There's no way I can tell whether this painting is going to work or not. That's one difference, I suppose. If I'd have done the pencils first and then done the pen lines, yeah, I would have a much better idea about the likelihood of success. Right, yeah. But I think particularly this, this, this orange band across the middle of the, the, the page, it's going to have so much black on it and I have to wait for it to, to dry. Right. That I think it's quite impossible for me to say how well this is going to work. I also, in my, my quest for um development in art. I bought some yeah. classical music CDs yesterday. I um, know good. next to nothing about classical music. Me too. I, Me too. Uh, I think there was a point in my life, probably about 10 or 12, maybe even longer actually, but certainly 10 years ago, where I thought, okay, it's time for jazz now. Yeah. <laughs> You're old enough. You secretly know <laughs> I think it happens to a lot of us. That. But I think there's also a thing with me that I was like, you secretly know it's brilliant. You know, you might have said things in the past, like, nah, I don't like jazz music, but you, yeah. you know that's not <laughs> true. You know you just have to be impatient with it. <laughs> and so I, so I spent I spent quite you know, I worked quite hard on it, really. I, I really, really did listen to jazz a lot for a, yeah. um, a few years and went to see it a lot and and really enjoyed not understanding something. And Because right. I still yeah. don't, really. I mean, I think maybe my idea of what melodically makes sense or what melodically can make sense is a bit broader now. And I think, you know... I, I have a wider appreciation of what melody and harmony can be. But essentially, yeah. really, when I listen to a jazz, uh, jazz music or I go and see jazz music, um, I am, I'm sort of a novice and I don't really understand what's going on. And hence, I understand it a little bit more from that. Whereas when I go and see an indie band, I can be like, yeah, I know what you're doing there. Yeah, and I don't like it. <laughs> but it's harder to like it. <laughs> it can be when you're over familiar. You know, it's a busman's holiday a little bit, you know. Mm. Well, I bought one one I didn't buy in the in test of exploration because I already knew it, and that was Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, which is right. a crossover from between like orchestral music and jazz, really. 
And there'll be some, there'll, there'll be refrains have. and melodies in there that you know. Yeah, absolutely. It won't be completely unknown to you. Yeah. Well, I did used to have it on cassette, so I do know it. Yeah. I'm not allowed to listen to it in about 20 years. But I also bought um, uh, uh, Glenn Gold playing the uh, Bach's Goldberg variations. Yeah. And I was going to get some Bach anyway because I knew he was definitely uh, a composer who developed themes. Uh, hence the Goldberg variations are all kind yeah. of variations on the theme. Um, I listened to that last night. What I wasn't prepared for is that some of the pieces are like 10 seconds long. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, how does one listen to that album all in one go? Or is that not the point? Because it seems to be, here's one idea. It's 10 seconds long. Now here's another idea. This one's 30 seconds long. This one's a minute long. And it's like, this does, does, it seems quite disjointed. So I'm going to have to, try to find a way of listening to them individually and get, get into them. And because like you, I think with jazz that you, you know, you worked at it to, to, because you knew there'd be rewards at the end of it. Well, And I think it'll be the same with this. Yeah. Maybe even works the wrong word. You just gave it I mean, some I think, time. I mean, I think if I really worked at it, I would have perhaps tried to understand how it was made and how it was played. Right. I, certainly, I certainly, as part of that period, I did buy a saxophone and I, I did there sort you of go. That, but, but I don't think any part of me, I think I knew the futility of ever thinking I was going to make a jazz album. And so that yeah. was quite freeing to know that I never was going to. Um, I like that feeling. Yeah. Don't worry, Darren, you're not going to make a jazz album. So this is all, this is all fun. Yeah. Because sometimes it's, sometimes everything becomes about the like becomes research for something, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it exactly. can be, it can be and that, tiring. And that's what I meant about sort of watching an indie uh, uh, or one of your contemporaries, you know, even if I'm, you know, watching one of my friends, if I'm watching say Robert Rotterford or something, as part of me that might, suddenly my work part of my brain kicks in and think, hmm, I wouldn't have done it like that. Yeah. I think a better line there would have been this. That's, that sounds horrible now. It sounds like I particularly do that with Robert. I, I, I mean, I do it with all sorts no, of people. No. It's, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that was just sort of impossible. I mean, to the, the extent that I went to start seeing sort of free improv jazz, I didn't really know whether i liked it at all in actual fact i i yeah. you know i could come away from uh some shows and thinking i don't know was was that good <laughs> you know is, is, is this emotion i'm carrying with me like i i saw something different i'm exhilarated by seeing something different but do you want to see it again tomorrow maybe not you know yeah yeah And I think that sort of stuff is, is easier in art, actually. I think going to see an art exhibition and coming away, not sh sure whether I liked it or not. But over the course of a couple of days, coming to the conclusion that I liked it, I think that's an advantage that art has over music. I think that decision is more instantaneous with music. Maybe not. Yes, it, it is, isn't it? It's sometimes, though, what, what is this? Turn it off. Get me out of here. In a, in, a, in, a, in a live situation, it is. I mean, you can you can see from the stage sometimes you just sort of see certain people and you think, I've lost you. I, I know I've lost you. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Off you go. <laughs> my initial feelings, I don't know if you can see on my page, is that these, uh, these blacks are, 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 are going to work quite well. Yeah, yes, it, it does. It it does need some black, I think, and that's certainly. Yeah, well, I'm thinking that the, the black is 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 more or less going to be the painting, actually. Mm. Like it's going to tell you what all the shapes are. But I just had to do it at the end.
pro tip. Got a pro tip for you for um, art supplies. Maybe less, less so for you, but I only found this this thing existed today. I've not got it yet. I'm going to order it. I'm drawing this on cartridge paper. Mm-hmm. And it's how heavy is it? Uh, 140 grams. So it's kind of good quality paper that I'm just using to sketch ideas on. And um, I, one might think it's a waste of good paper. And even I might think that. I've discovered you can get pads, A3 pads of 100 sheets of newsprint paper. Ah. So it's really kind of, you know, it's cheap. It's probably a little bit too thick. It'd be great for just doing ideas on again and yeah. again and again and again. So I'm going to order some of that. Anyway, to, to, with, you know, you, they often say use your sketchbook for ideas, but sketchbooks. That's an, interest, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting thing to talk about in terms of what we're talking about today. The idea of waste, yeah. Uh, the idea of waste in terms of materials or paper, but the also the idea of um, waste in terms of time. The yeah. idea, I mean, and I think the answer is, although it's easy to say to say this, I don't know whether I practice it, but I think the answer is to say. Um, you're never wasting your time. No. And uh, I think particularly now that I'm, I'm trying, my next project is with a band, and 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 it's it's it's, it's uh, sometimes sometimes incredibly frustrating to try and get a. Uh, I mean the, the I mean the problem with nearly all bands now is just getting them in the same room. You know, just trying yes, to get isn't it four adults. <laughs> Yeah. one evening of a week is, is just really hard. Um, and so then, then the value of the time once you get them there is, you know, uh, immediately called into question. You know, are we making yeah. enough use of this time? Um, I think I'm terrible with that. I think I'm, 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 I have terrible anxieties about feeling like I've wasted time. Right. And uh, someone quite close to me is, is often admonishing me for, for, for my inability to do nothing. And even that sounds, sounds a bit like I'm romanticising it. Oh, I'm such a workaholic. I just can't stop. Which is sort of true. I, 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 I guess I probably am a workaholic. Famously won an award for it. Yes, won an award for, for working too hard. But I don't, I don't mean that. I don't, I don't mean it to sound like only a good thing. I, I mean it to sound no. like a bad thing, that there's an anxiety about time and how I use it, which yeah. um, is not helpful. You know, I think that, you know, I should be going into band rehearsals, not thinking, right, we've got this to do and this to do. And I want that song done and that song done. So then we can recall by this time next month. Well, I don't don't think that's, I think, I think there's, I think there's advantages to that in some ways, but I I don't, you know, I don't think it matters if it takes longer either. I see. I, I feel your pain so much because I was exactly the same in band rehearsals. I, I I hated them, and I, I, I was the same for you. If we didn't really come away with a song worked out or a, a good set rehearsed, I'd feel they were a complete waste, absolute complete waste. Yeah. And the the band could tell, um, but they kind of enjoyed my pain and would definitely wind me up on purpose. They were bastards. Um, one of them may be watching this. <laughs> um, 
No, I mean, I, I'm thinking in particular at the moment with um, this band, and I'm thinking about one song that we recorded a couple of months ago. And I'm thinking about how many times that song wasn't right. And I would say that that would be a song that developed very much. Uh, yeah, actually, the more and more and more we're going in this conversation, I'm thinking I do do this kind of creativity all the time now. But yeah, that would be an example of a song where, okay, it doesn't work like that. I rewrote the chorus. We took, we did a different tempo. We did that. Quite an unusual song, I think. Right. Maybe I should send send it to you. But um, mm. a song, a song that doesn't particularly sound obviously Heyman in in. <sighs> I don't know. And I, I'm just, I just think that that song needed to take that long is, is what I'm thinking. Yeah. That, that it, it just did. It, it needed all of those rehearsals, all of those wrong versions. Um, Tell you what, if anyone's tuned in expecting more retro toys, they're going to be very disappointed. Well, can't all be fun and games, can it? Can't, can't always be chasing those uh, YouTube figures. <laughs> I'm really pleased with this way of working. I've got one, two, three. I've got three. Definitely three things I'm going to do separately. Three ideas from this. I've got a lino print. I've got a possible little animation. And I've got painting. Maybe an oil painting. I'm not sure. My silence is due to me doing a hard bit, not, not, not That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and this close up here, this could be a line or print here. The, the, the thing we're doing line or prints of this is that I should probably ask Sean, who created this little character in the first place, if he minds me doing line or prints. I was thinking that actually. That's interesting, isn't it? Because you are doing, mind you, actually, well, that's, that's a completely different conversation, isn't it? I was going to say, you're doing someone else's intellectual property. But then, of course, what am I doing when I paint Star Wars figures? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Different when you know them, isn't it? I mean, it, it isn't different, but it feels different. But well, this process that I've done can be can be done for many things, can't it? It's just a way of thinking visually. Uh, well, I like to, I, I like to think... For me, there's a distinction in that I'm painting a picture of the toy of how yes, you are, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, and and, yeah, and absolutely, me, there's a slight distinction there between painting Harrison Ford, which I yeah. sort of feel like is something I very much don't want to do. Yeah, it's a definite distinction. <sighs> you're painting an object; it's a still life that what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, but so is what you're doing there. But I, I think it's it is. But I think it's interesting when you say, "Oh, I'll do a lino cut of the painting of a still life," and then two things could happen, right? The abstraction could become increasingly more pronounced, so that it looks yes. less and less like your friend's character. That's I mean that's but, what's happened. Yeah. But also it could be that it becomes more and more simplified. Yeah. 
And so eventually sort of becomes a little bit more like his character. It starts to look like yeah. a cartoony drawing of the character, in which case, yeah. you know, you might want to say to, oh, oopsie daisy, look, this looks a bit like your thing. Mm. The same I mean, with Peter. Certainly- if, I did, if I drew a stormtrooper, drew a still life to stormtrooper, actually acted it a bit more, turned it into a, you know, a, a liner cut or a sculptural stormtrooper, it might, some of those filtered layers might start to disappear. Yeah, yeah. I've got another idea here that's interesting because I drew, I've got the, the basic shape of this is kind of like the column with a with a, a ball on the end, basically. Uh, and I've written next to one of these, uh, Celtic Cross. It looks kind of like a, a gravestone. Let me have a look now. So, Show me again. So we've got we've got that, just the yeah. shape of it. And then I've drawn this here. That right, yeah. It's to look more like a Celtic cross. And look, I like how that that works in that you start off drawing a model, little model of Gentle Jeff, and it could move you onto a whole project of drawing uh, gravestones in yeah. church yeah. yeah. That's that kind of that thing where I was saying about Hopefully, one idea will always lead on to two or three other ideas. Yeah. I like that. Hey, everybody, buy my um, Celtic Cross (laughs) T-shirts. Coming soon. (laughs) What do you think I'm doing here? How do I think you're doing? Yeah. Doing well. I was expected there's hardly any of that. I just knew there was loads of this rusted orange coming through. I was quite pleased yeah. about quite pleased about how that's worked out. And I sort of knew that I had to paint an orange strip and then gradually knock it back. But it took quite a bit of forward planning. You were right about them wheels as well. Yeah, you can't really see them, right? No, no, but it looks right. It, mm. it, it, there's a there's a weight to it. It looks like it's sitting on rails. Yeah, it's quite hard. I've misjudged it as well. And even here, I'm, I think I've got it right in the end, but there's um, like the actual amount of train, like the amount of train that is underneath them is quite a lot. Because it's weird. When trains come into the platform, you're at platform level. So all you see is the carriage bit and you think of that yeah. as a train. And then when you draw it outside, yeah. it's one of those things of having to trust your eyes. It's like, oh no, they, that, that carriage thing really is sort of f- four feet off the ground. Yeah. You have to believe that it's, it's that shape. Well, I filled my page. Yeah, I think I think I'm I'm tempted to leave mine now. I mean, there's all sorts of bits where you feel there could be greater detail, but it's it's the limit of of what the brush can do. Yeah, you know, like I know that there's more things on the front of this this train, but just bring out these windows here a little bit. I use blotting paper a lot with these kind of things. Sorry? I use the kitchen roll a lot with these kind of paintings. Yeah, you're you're taking stuff off as much as you're putting it on. Yep, yeah, and and you start to real. I think like my whole thing with watercolor came from a point of like me sort of saying, you know, watercolor doesn't have to be as 
fragile and delicate as you think it does. So I sort of mm-hmm. developed this way of painting quite boldly with watercolour. And I think it's taken me a long time to finally realise, oh, but it can be. <laughs> yes. You know, it, can, it can be a very sort of um, delicate, pretty thing. And I think I've sort of spent years of being scared at making it that pretty. Finding the balance between you want some of the boldness. Yeah, I don't know. Like a train is a really chunky thing. So I felt like I've always had to go in it with line. And and I don't know. Chug, chug, chug. I'm quite pleased with that. Are you finished over there? I'm finished. I, I suppose finished. you're never yeah. necessarily finished. But that's the point of what you're doing. Well, no, I'm moving on for, for other things yeah. from this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, still can't make this whatever it is, this tower in the background. Do you think that's enough? Do you think that's enough? I think it's split? enough. Okay. Yeah, I think it's I know. I can tell it's a tower. Yeah. Okay, then. I think I'm done then. Me too. Bye-bye, Darren. Bye, Darren.